Record. Okay, so a uh, few things this morning. One, I noticed the homework set that was due today took a little bit longer than the first two assignments. Was there any sort of one or two problems that were just kind of tricky that took a bit of time? Or was the whole thing kind of hard? What do you guys think? One or two problems tricky? Or just the problems are taking a little bit longer on average than the first set? Yeah. Let's try to keep an eye. I don't want these sets to get over about 20 to 30 minutes in time. The average time is about 25 minutes, so it's not absurdly long. But I want us to really devote our time to reading as much as we can. I know nobody likes reading. Um, the audio version of the book is actually not bad on the, um, uh, on the MyLab side. So if you want to check that out, it's actually a robot. It's not too bad in terms of, it's, it's not like a live human reading the textbook. But it's actually not a, a bad audio version, if that's useful for you. Um, and then the other thing is like those daily quizzes. So check out those daily quizzes. There's, uh, they're not required, they're just for practice. And the main page of Carmen, there's a, a link to get into the quiz area. Um, and there's like quizzes for every day this week. Not that I recommend you do quizzes every day, but I think making quizzing and sort of self-assessment part of your learning will help you, especially when it comes to exams where you're taking exams in that kind of setting with closed book, closed note. Um, so if you treat your quizzes that way, I think you'll get, give yourself some authentic practice. They'll be useful as we start getting into midterm season in a couple weeks. So the first midterm, I think it's September 21st. It's on a Wednesday night. Um, you might start looking at your schedule, making sure you don't have any conflicts. If you do, there's uh, some links in Carmen on signing up for an alternate time exam. If you're not sure um, how to do that, just shoot me an email or something. I'll try to point you in the right direction. And then uh, think about your studying in terms of preparing for the midterm. So let's start doing that studying like today, you know, next week, more slowly as we go throughout the material as opposed to just studying the night before the test or the weekend before the test. Okay, so let's get into chapter two. So chapter one was kind of just introduction to chemistry, introduction to some of the math tools like significant figures, rounding, dimensional analysis. As we get into chapter two, we start getting into some actual more topics of chemistry like atoms, molecules, and ions as you see is the name of the chapter. Um, so the first couple sections in chapter two get into how we came to know some details about atoms, the subatomic structure. I suspect almost everybody in the room knows about protons, neutrons, electrons being the subatomic particles that comprise atoms. So we'll talk a little bit about their discovery um, so that we can understand how we came to know about the, say, the nuclear structure of atoms, that the protons and neutrons are the nucleus of the atoms, the electrons sort of spinning around the nucleus. So we'll come to talk a little bit about how we came to know those details. And we'll talk a little bit about modern atomic structure, kind of that detail there, the nuclear structure of the atom. So we can look at atoms or ions and be able to count up the number of protons versus uh, electrons, things like that. Um, then we'll get into atomic weights. We can look at a periodic table and see the average atomic weight for elements listed. We'll try to understand what that average atomic weight means, why um, you know, some elements exist as one or more different isotopes. And then as we get towards the end of the chapter, we'll try to look at some different types of molecules and compounds so we can classify them into different categories and then be able to name some common type compounds that we'll see in a lot of examples and in the laboratory. So we'll name things like ionic compounds, we'll name things like hydrocarbons, alcohols of hydrocarbons, and some things we call like binary compounds. Binary compounds are actually pretty common, you, like CO2 is one, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. So common molecular compounds that contain like two elements, um, we'll learn how to name those things as we go throughout the chapter. Um, I think a lot of the topics in Chem 1210 will mostly contain things you've seen before, but maybe not necessarily remember so well. That's probably why you have to take the class here. Um, so hopefully a lot of the vocabulary, words, and the topics we're covering are things you've seen before um, that we can build from. One thing different, just to get us acclimated to the expectations of this class, as you start looking at practice quizzes, practice exams, it's almost as if every piece of the content you're expected to remember and use and be able to recall for different types of problems. So that's one thing that's a little bit different from high school coming into chemistry, is just needing that like kind of recall of information as we go throughout the course. So anyways, getting into the um, sort of atomic theory of matter, um, it was in the early 1800s that um, John Dalton and some others started thinking that you know, matter is probably comprised of sort of building blocks and the building blocks of matter being something maybe like atoms that we think of today, and that um, different types of matter would be comprised of different types of elements. So back then, what scientists were trying to do was take matter and just see what you can break it apart into. So could we take like an iron ore and then separate it into some component like maybe a metal and a gas? 
And then when he got the metal, could we break that apart further? And they found that they couldn't. So that sort of led to the idea that iron must be an element, and then the ore must have been some type of compound. So if you could take almost that chart from chapter one, if you could take a substance and find some chemical way to break it apart into two different substances, then you must have you know, a compound to begin with. And then if you get to a point where you can't break um, a substance apart into two or more different components, then you probably have an element. And so at that time was when things like iron were discovered, zinc, um, a lot of metals were discovered. You can imagine it's, you know, once you get to a, a metallic substance or a metal solid substance that doesn't break apart further, it's pretty easy to identify and classify and differentiate that type of substance from other types of metals. And so this also um, sort of led to some ideas that elements, you know, um, maybe comprised of atoms, and then the atoms of the same element are the same as each other. So all the atoms of iron are the same, all the atoms of zinc are the same. Now this, in, in essence, in the early 1800s, turned out not to be true exactly. Like we know today that most elements uh, can exist as different isotopes, but isotopes was definitely not in the lingo or in the purview of the understanding of, at the time. So it was sort of thought that all the elements, uh, all the atoms of a given element would be the same, and that elements could not interconvert to each other. So like if you had zinc, you couldn't just somehow turn it into iron and vice versa. Um, and it turns out today that you actually can interconvert elements, but not easily. It's not something you just go in the lab and mix it up and turn zinc into iron. But you can bombard things with protons and neutrons and do all kinds of crazy physics experiments that can't interconvert elements, but it's a very rare event. I would say chemical reactions don't interconvert elements, but maybe through some physical events you could observe or um, cause the, the transformation of elements, but not through easy means. And then compounds form whenever atoms of different elements combine. So you can take different elements, combine them together, like carbon, oxygen, form CO2, or carbon monoxide. Conservation of mass would mean that when we have a reaction, like if we have carbon you know, plus O2 forming CO2, that we're not destroying the carbon mass, we're not destroying the oxygen mass, we're conserving that mass as we form the CO2. Um, so we can't lose mass. So that just means when we balance reactions in the chapter three that we're gonna balance them and not have substances disappearing from the, the reactant side versus the product side of our reaction. And then the law of multiple proportions is a weird rule that just more or less says that when compounds form like CO2 or like KCl, like if you have a compound that you get a specific ratio, like for KCl it's one to one. And that's the proportion. So the law of multiple proportions would say that a compound forms in specific ratios of the elements in the formula. So carbon dioxide can form with one to two carbons to oxygens. You can have other compounds, like obviously carbon monoxide exists, so maybe we can have carbon and oxygen react together where we get carbon monoxide, where we get a one-to-one -one ratio. But just for a given molecule or a given compound, you have some specific ratio of the atoms that remain intact. So that's the law of multiple proportions. And then some of the uh, important discoveries that allowed us to determine the subatomic structure of atoms sort of began in the late 1800s with the discovery of the electron through the cathode ray tube experiment. Now what this experiment um, sort of had done was it put a high voltage electricity onto a gas sample and then that caused um, something to be ejected at the time. The uh, particle that was ejected from the atom or the particle that was formed would fly to a screen, kind of like an old cathode ray tube, like the old big TV. Um, and it would hit the screen and just light the screen up. And so you can kind of see where the particles hitting the screen by seeing where the colors lit up on that TV screen or that phosphor screen on the other side of the apparatus. And then what was observed is if you applied electrical field, if you put, say, the positive direction of your electric field, let me change colors here. So if you took the positive direction of the electric field, you can actually bend the particle downward. So you can change the particle's trajectory by the use of an electrical field. And that sort of showed that the particle had to have a charge and then if you had the particle going towards the positive direction of the electric field, implied that this particle must have a negative charge. And so the negative charge of the electron was observed through forming the electron by having a high amount of electricity that caused the electron to be ejected from the atom. And then the electron was found to be negative in charge because it went downward relative to the electric field. Now, the key numerical discovery in the experiment, not a number worth memorizing, but a numerical discovery was made in this experiment, which was the mass to charge ratio of the electron. And the only thing that's interesting there is that this experiment didn't discover the mass or the charge specifically of the electron, just the ratio of the mass to charge. 
Okay, so the idea here, high amount of energy caused a subatomic particle to be ejected from an atom with a negative charge. Uh, Millikan came around and said, and tried to determine the mass and charge of the electron by kind of making the same charge but on an oil drop. And the oil drop would actually contain multiple amounts of these negative charges. You can imagine an oil drop, um, there's some sort of atomizer to sort of spray the oil into a vacuum chamber. And then those particles are actually falling relative to gravity. And then you could put an X-ray, kind of like a high energy source, sort of like the high voltage source in the previous slide. An X-ray is actually creating negative particles on the droplets. So these droplets here, if you could see one of them, you could see that a droplet could contain multiple electrons. And then depending on how many negative particles were on the particle, it would fall faster or slower by the application of the electric field. There's a lot of physics behind these experiments that I don't really like to dwell too much on, but the idea of this experiment is just by knowing gravity versus the electric field that was applied versus how fast the particles were falling, you could get a sense of the actual mass and charge of the electron. So the key of this experiment here is that it determined the mass of the electron, really small, um, obviously, like when something's 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, that's really low mass, but it's about one, two, uh, one, Two, ha, can't talk today. One two thousandth the mass of the H atom. And so it is obviously a subatomic particle if it is much lighter than the lightest element or the lightest atom of the lightest element. And then the charge was also discovered negative, of course, for the negative particle electron, minus 1.61 uh, times 10 to minus 19 coulombs uh, for the charge of the electron. So this experiment here uh, furnished the discovery of the mass of the electron and the charge of the electron. Some other experiments that were important in the early days of the discovery of atomic structure were uh, Curry's discovery of the radioactivity pathways. I think it was uranium was the element she was looking at. Um, two Nobel Prizes for the work of uh, the discovery of these radioactivity pathways. But um, three pathways were observed. One was actually very similar to the particle that was observed in the uh, cathode ray tube experiment by Thompson and in the Millikan oil drop experiment, similar particle. A beta ray was observed and it was negatively charged and they could tell it was negatively charged because the particle would go upward toward the uh, positive direction of the electric field. And so this is why this was the negative particle an alpha ray was observed. Notice the alpha ray is going down a little bit, but not as high. The negative electron had a lighter mass, it was going higher. The alpha ray must have been more massive because the particle wasn't going downward as much as that beta ray. So the alpha ray, this is an interesting question. I've tried to look into this one day. I couldn't figure out when they came to know this detail, but the alpha ray um, just turned out to be a helium nuclei. So this turns out just to be the helium nucleus with the two plus charge, so no electrons on the helium, so just the nuclei of a helium atom. And so it, to me, it's still an interesting question of like, at what point did they know that that's what the alpha particle was, as opposed to just a positive particle that had more mass than the electron's mass. And so we'll see that, you know, this is our mass number for an atom. It contains, the, the, the mass number is where most of the mass in the nuclei or in the atoms coming from. This is from the sum of the protons and the neutrons. So when we're kicking that really light electron off, most of the mass is left behind in terms of the nuclei, in terms of the protons and neutrons. This down here is the atomic number. It's the number that corresponds with the element on a periodic table, so helium's the second element, that's why its math, uh, atomic number is two. This is the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. So the proton count is really what's defining the element. So an element is defined by how many protons it has in its nucleus, hydrogen, the least number of just one, helium two, et cetera. So it turns out that the helium nucleus is just one of the most exquisitely stable nuclei. When you look at decaying matter, if you look at a piece of uranium that's decaying, one of the key decay pathways is losing that really stable nuclei and becoming a smaller atom. Um, this is why I believe uranium is the largest element that naturally uh, is occurring on, this, uh, on Earth because presumably everything after uranium, element number 92, if you notice that they're in a different shade on the periodic table, all those elements had already decayed to uranium. 
because their decay lifetimes, their, their natural lifetimes in the uh, universe were just shorter. They were decaying faster. So at some point, maybe in, I forget, I think the lifetime of uranium is like, half life's like four and a half trillion years, somewhere in that ballpark. But presumably at some point, trillions of years from now in chemistry class, that's obviously not gonna be a thing. But um, if that is a thing, uranium probably will be in that same shading and no longer here. So elements are slowly disappearing as their pathways, as they're decaying into other smaller nuclei. Um, and so, so anyways, the number of protons is what's defining the element. So for example, uranium, we might write its symbol as U92, because it has 92 protons in its nucleus. Um, and then the alpha rays are a high energy part, or excuse me, not the alpha rays, the gamma ray, the middle ray here, this here is just a high packet of energy. So it's kind of like a, a light wave of just really high energy. Sometimes we'll express it as H nu. We'll see this equation in uh, um, chapter six. But E is equal to H nu is an equation that relates how much energy a wavelength or a, a photon of light contains. So this is the energy of light or radiant energy. And so it's a really high energy uh, particle. It's actually higher energy than x-rays not something you'd want to encounter if you could avoid it. It actually turns out that um, Curry died, I believe in her 30s from cancer, from all the radiation that was being absorbed by her, not knowing that these pathways were extremely hazardous to, to be around. But so these discoveries went into just understanding the sort of some of the fundamental natures of the radioactive pathways that atoms could undergo. One of the things that's really interesting is this alpha rays used in our next experiment. So I think we're also introduced to these pathways to understand in this experiment here, that this ray that we're gonna start with, we're starting with those alpha particles. So we're starting with that alpha particle that was observed in that previous experiment. So if we could take a beam of alpha particles, which we now know are helium nuclei, and sort of like shoot them almost like, like, a, like they're a, a, a gun or something at a piece of gold foil, what do we think is gonna happen? So we just have a strip, thin strip of gold foil, almost as like thin as you can get, like as thin as you can shave off a piece of gold foil, we're gonna shoot a particle at it. Now, if you have something solid, can't see through it, and you shoot a particle at it, why would it do anything but bounce back right at you or off sideways? Well, Rutherford was trying to discover how were the subatomic particles in the, new, in the atom distributed. If all the particles were kind of like this, if you just had an atom with all the electrons, all the protons, all the neutrons distributed equally in the atom, then it would be a solid sheet, and we'd probably hit it. It would hit one of those particles and bounce off. Well, it turned out most of the particles went straight through the, the piece of gold. It's kind of like this quote here. It's like the most incredible event that had ever happened to me in my life, is what Rutherford said. It was almost as incredible as if, as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper, and then the shell came bouncing back at you. It was sort of the, the way the discovery was thought. Such a high-energy particle traveling very fast at a solid object, and went right through. And so it went right through because there actually turned out to be a lot of gaps between the atoms because most of the mass of the atom is centered in the nucleus. So if you take all the subatomic particles that contain mass, put them in a compact nucleus, well, what are the odds that you're gonna have a nuclei in the way of that beam coming through? So if you only have a, a few layers of atoms in this piece of gold, then there's a lot of gaps for that sort of high energy particle to make it through the atom. It wouldn't be the case if it really had this, like if, if you call it plum pudding model of the subatomic particles where they're all interdistributed. So it really led to the idea, going back to slides doesn't work so well, it, it came to the idea of the nuclear model. So the conclusion of this experiment is the nuclear model and that our protons and neutrons are in the nucleus and then the electrons are spinning around the outside of the atom. And the electrons don't contain much mass so if a particle hits an electron, it's not gonna deflect off. The, the mass is too small for the electron. And it also makes sense that you would take the more massive particles that contain a lot of mass and get them away from that faster, lighter particle. And so from like the kinetic energy equation that we're seeing before, the lighter the particle, probably the faster it's gonna be moving. The heavier the particle, the slower. And so it kind of makes sense that we're gonna to try to keep the fast particles separated from the slower particles. And so the nature of the, the atom just led that beam of alpha particles to passing right through the metal sample most of the time. Okay, that the atom, here I'll come 
Well, so some, the, some key summaries, some key walking away points from these opening experiments is Thomson's cathode ray tube experiment, late 1800s, allowed the discovery of the electron and the mass to charge ratio of the electron. Millikan's oil drop experiment through uh, the use of gravity versus an electric field allowed the determination of the mass and charge of the electron. It allowed the establishment that the electron was really um, low in mass compared to the lightest known element. Curry's radioactivity experiment showed us the alpha, beta, and gamma pathways, the alpha ray being the helium nucleus, the positive particle, the beta ray being the negative, and the gamma ray being neutral. And the gamma ray itself not even being a particle but being light or electromagnetic radiation. So a high energy packet of light was the gamma ray. And then the use of that alpha particle, the alpha scattering gold foil experiment allowed the discovery of the nuclear model of the atom. And so some discoveries that are mentioned by date but not by actual experiment on how they were observed um, is the proton discovery later in 1919, um, and then the discovery of the neutron not until 1932. And so I just think it's kind of interesting that over about a 20 to 30 year gap, we went from really knowing not much about the structure of atoms to knowing almost everything we'd want to know. And also in this time is when you had the development of a lot of computational theory on being able to understand quantum mechanically what's going behind atoms, and that of course led to the atomic bomb. So um, further discussions into these areas, which we're not going to go much into, um, really interesting and fascinating in terms of their rapid discovery and then use. Um, so the nuclear model of the atom, in terms of the size of the nucleus, if you think of the size of the spinning of those electrons around the atom, you might have a one to five angstrom. One angstrom is a 10 to the minus 10 meter. So an angstrom is obviously really small. So about one to five times 10 to the minus 10 meters is the sort of diameter of an atom. But then the nucleus diameter is about 10 to the minus four angstrom. So much, much smaller. So a really compact nucleus containing those positive and neutral particles. And so a really small, dense, positive nuclear center surrounded by the electrons. Um, and so the protons, neutrons in the nucleus. And so let's take a look at the relative mass differences between protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so in atomic mass units, I think there's a slide a little bit later that talks about conversions between the atomic mass unit scale and grams. Um, I mean, I could give you the conversion. It's a really interesting conversion on how you get this scale here from something like grams that we're more accustomed to using because the conversion is actually a number we, we've probably seen before and that one gram of a substance is equal to an AMU, an Avogadro's number of AMU. It turns out to be 6.022. And you could look up more digits if you want. Sometimes I'll write this just to imply that there's more digits known in the value times 10 to the 23 AMU. So a gram of a substance contains a tremendous number of AMUs. An AMU is representing obviously a really small mass. So we could write the mass of the proton, neutron, electron in AMU like we see here. We could convert those to grams if for some reason we wanted to. But the key is seeing that these particles are the mass of one single proton, really small number of, a, uh, of grams. So protons charge as we often call it just plus one unit of charge. It's the exact opposite of the sign of the electron. So the proton and electron have the same magnitudes of charge, just opposite in sign. So this helps you understand that an element like hydrogen, which has one proton, if it has a neutral charge, a lot of times we don't write the zero when there's no charge, but if it has no charge. So this is the charge here of zero. If the charge is zero, Sorry, my handwriting is. So the charge is zero. It has one proton. Protons, one positive particle. How many electrons would it have? Just one. So we have that balance between one positive particle, one negative particle, overall charge of neutral. So protons, electrons, opposite in their signs, but same in their magnitudes, and the neutron is neutral. Uh, the mass number of the most common or the most abundant isotope of hydrogen on Earth is one. So if the mass number of hydrogen is one and its atomic number is one, so the mass number here, again, if you 
recall from the previous slide that the mass number is the number of protons plus neutrons. We have one proton, mass number of one, so we must have zero neutrons. So the most abundant form of hydrogen has zero neutrons, one proton, and one electron. Okay, so the protons and neutrons, if the atom has a neutron, reside in the nucleus, and then the electron spinning outside. And you can see that the mass of the proton neutron pretty close to one AMU, and the mass of the electron much smaller. It's important to note that these are resting masses of these subatomic particles. If you look at something like a carbon atom, so if you were to look at, say, carbon, and the most abundant form of carbon is carbon-12, um, so where it has a mass number of 12, Carbon's atomic number in the periodic table is six, so we have six protons. And then if the 12 is the protons plus the neutrons, we must have six neutrons. That's where we get the 12 from. And then if we're neutral in charge, again, I'm not gonna actually write that in here, so if we don't see a plus one or a plus two or a minus one or a minus two, we'll talk a little bit later about ions, but if we don't see the charge noted, it's neutral. So we have six electrons. If you want to come up with the mass of the carbon-12 nucleus, you wouldn't just take six protons masses, six neutron masses, and six electron masses. That's not going to allow you to calculate the average mass of carbon-12. Um, and the reason why is those particles have a stability energy. So when those particles reside together, they lower the stability of the atom. E is equal to mc squared. You lower the energy of the atom, then you change its mass. And so the subatomic particles, those are the resting masses. So we can't just add those up. We'd have to like look up the mass of carbon-12. Turns out it's defined to be 12 AMU. That's going to be something we talk about a little bit later. But the mass of carbon-12 is actually precisely known to be 12 atomic mass units, not 1.0073 times 6 plus 1.00. So we're showing you the mass of the proton neutron, not so that you start adding them up to come up with atomic weights. Okay, so protons, neutrons residing in the nucleus. Um, the mass number is relating to those number of particles. Electrons and protons, again, identical, um, uh, but opposite sign charges. And then the atomic symbol, atomic number, mass number up top. And one other way we can write the name of an element is this way here, where we can write the element name and then followed by the mass number. So we can call this carbon-12. And we can differentiate that from something like carbon-13. So carbon-13 would just be carbon with a mass number of 13. Still has a mass number of 6. Remember, if we change the, excuse me, still has an atomic number of 6. So this number here, if that were to change, we would actually change the identity of the element. So carbon always has an atomic number of 6. If the atomic number changes, the number of protons change in the atom, we now have a new element. So carbon-13 changes in neutron count. Probably not so surprising that elements can exist with a different number of that neutral particle. And so carbon-13 does exist. This would have six protons, seven neutrons for six plus seven going to 13. And so this just turns out to be about 1% of a natural sample of carbon, and then about 99% is carbon-12. And those ratios, you don't have to memorize them, but the the ratios of the different isotopes of elements is a very complex and interesting topic because it really relates to the big elements like uranium and the other radioactive elements that are decaying into smaller nuclei that give you a lot of times those lower abundant isotopes that you find for elements like carbon-13 and carbon-14. Like there's some pathway, I don't remember it exactly, but carbon-14 is formed from some decay pathway of like nitrogen. So when you eat food, you have nitrogen. And one of the elements that's in the nitrogen sample you're eating will eventually decay into carbon-14. And over time, that carbon-14 decays into other things. And so um, your carbon-14 ratio that you have in your body is almost indicative of how long you've been living once you no longer are taking in like natural um, food sources. So you can date objects with carbon dating by seeing how much of some unstable isotope that they still contain. So um, a lot of elements may exist as two or more isotopes. Some elements happen to exist predominantly as just one isotope. It really just kind of depends on the element. But for now, we're just going to try to count particles and try to understand how we get proton, neutron, electron counts. And so how many neutrons does a copper 64 atom have? 
And so I mentioned before, like being able to know the symbol, like, like CO is cobalt. So if this is on a test, you know, I want to make sure that we know copper CU. I think most of us probably remember that. And so being able to recognize that this is a test question, then we may just have to know that we're referring to element number 29 here of CU for copper. And then the mass number would be up here for 64. And so think for like 30 seconds on how many neutrons the copper atom has. Okay, so yes. So a periodic table will always be provided for exams. So yeah, always have a periodic table nearby when you're doing homework. Um, the yeah, the, I have one on like a sample info packet on the daily quiz area. So if you want like a sample info page along with a periodic table for one quick reference, you can have that available. But any periodic table would be useful. I don't think the one we give you on the test has the symbol and name. We usually just give you the symbol. So that's why I say you got to just know the name versus symbol, symbol versus name for the first few rows of the periodic table, so that we don't ever, you know, get manganese and magnesium backwards when we're doing examples like that. Okay, so the key is just really remembering that this is the number of protons. So if you had thought the answer was 29, that's just the number of protons. And then the sum of the protons and neutrons is 64. So 64 minus 29 is 35. This would be the number of neutrons. Because this number here is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So we get 35. If the question had asked, how many electrons does this atom have if it's neutral in charge? 29. So if this atom's neutral in charge, would have 29 electrons. If this atom had a net positive charge, so if we had copper plus instead of just copper zero, so if we did a different example and we said we have an atom that's copper plus, uh, what we can do with atoms is we can kick those electrons on and off. We can maybe add electrons to atoms or remove electrons from atoms. That nucleus, we're not easily kicking protons in and out. That's why I said by chemical means, that nucleus is really inaccessible for easy change. The electrons on the outside of the atom, though, we can remove some, we can add some depending on the circumstances. We'll see predominantly our metals go positive and charge in stable ions, and we'll see predominantly the non-metal elements on the right side of the periodic table tend to go negative in their charges. Okay, so for copper plus, if we have a net positive charge, do you think we have more protons or more electrons in the atom? We have to have more protons, more of the positive charge, have a net positive charge. So here we've lost one electron. So we've lost one electron to get the positive charge. We're either losing electrons to make cations or gaining electrons to make anions. And so we've lost an electron to make the cation, so we would have 28 electrons for copper plus. Oh, okay, so I threw in, in the notes, there's gonna be a problem next lecture too, just randomly on sig figs, just to kind of, to almost take like a, a time out to say, okay, let's look at a sig fig problem and see if we can do it. So let me give you guys, pro probably at least two minutes, as soon as I stop seeing writing and, and thought here. So take two minutes, if you need to talk with your neighbors, feel free to try to figure out this question here. So all these numbers are representing some inherent and precise values that are measurements. One tiny aside before you start crunching this is, I really almost prefer if they throw like units into these things so that you can kind of see that, oh, these are all ordinary lab measurements. But whenever you see a sig fig problem, you're assuming that these are um, those values that are subject to sig fig rules. <laughs> 
let's talk about this one. I, I see a few groups of people, I think, that are still fiercely debating on what the answer is. That's, that's interesting to see. Who thinks it's, uh, let's go reverse order. Who thinks it's, it's D? OK, who thinks it's C? No, I don't think I see any of my hands. Who thinks it's B? Probably a few hands for B. And then A, probably nobody thinks it's A. Oh, so he thinks it's A, sorry. Um, maybe it's A, but we'll see. OK, so I think the answer is D, but let's take a look. So when we, we need to do the multiplication step first. You know, before we do the subtraction, we're doing the multiplication. So let's think about the multiplication rule and the multiplication step first. It's like an order of operations kind of problem first. So we're doing 2.5 times 0.295. And so that gives me 0.7375 when I do this step here. Now, how many digits is that value good to? two sig figs, because we have two sig figs times three in the multiplication rules. We count sig figs, so two would limit our result to two sig figs. Um, in a multi-step problem, I get this a lot. Should I round? Should I keep it? What should I do? Um, on a question like this, it's not going to make any difference if we round or not. We're going to get the right answer if we round here versus if we don't round. On a lot of test questions, it's not going to make much of a difference. It'll probably just be the difference if you round on some examples. Maybe you get 1.04 in your calculator, and it's really 1.03, but you can easily still get the right answer. Um, in lab or in problems where we're going to use this calculation and subsequent calculations, we might want to keep the 0.75 on for what I call the ride. So we might just kind of do the next step like this, where I have 12.267 minus 0 0.7375. And I could have rounded that to 0.74, but I just keep an underline under it, because I know that's the last digit that's significant. Because that's what really matters when I'm doing my subtraction step, is I take the two values, I have thousands place, and hundreds place. The greater value placeholder is the one I round to. So I round to this placeholder here when I carry out this arithmetic. And so I'm going to end up at 11 point something. So when I do 12.267, and I can even minus 0.74. It's going to give me this, mostly the same answer. So 11.53 to the hundreds place. So addition, subtraction is all about placeholders or decimal places, if you want to call them that, whatever word better suits you. It's whatever value is higher in value we round to. And so we'll keep all four, we'll keep four sig figs in this value here. OK, so we'll see some other sample problems. There's a bunch of sig fig questions on those like sample quizzes. So if you just need to see more practice on sig fig problems, check out those daily quizzes. One nice thing with the daily quiz, if there is one topic you're stuck on, just go look for the questions on that one topic and then skip the others if that's what, what you need studying. OK, so let's take a quick look at the periodic table. So kind of putting the sort of periodic table together. The interesting thing, I think in chapter 7, we talked a little bit about the discovery of the timeline of some different elements on the periodic table. But for now, we have our you know, full assembled periodic table. We have some different groups of elements that you've probably come to know. We were talking earlier that the, this side of the periodic tables are metals. It's labeled here. I guess I didn't have to write that. We have our metalloids that are kind of the group of elements in between the metals and the nonmetals that share some properties of metallic versus nonmetallic elements. And then we have our nonmetal compounds, where a lot of the nonmetal elements are gases at room temperature, but not all of them, like carbon is a solid. But you can imagine, like, diamond has a much different type of appearance and properties than something like iron. So when you think of metals, you usually think of, you know, shiny. Uh, lustery metals that you can sort of, um, that are they're, they're hard in their structures, you can pound them in the sheets, you can build things out of them. And your non-metallic solids are usually things that you're probably not going to build a structure out of diamond or things like that. You can build a lot of uh, processing power out of silicon and the metalloid elements. So metalloid elements are interesting, a lot of their semiconductor properties. Um, and then we also have the non-metals being like, like the, the whole group of elements that are gases being the noble gases. We have the halogens that contains a couple gases, like fluorine and chlorine are gases at room temperature. There's actually only two elements that are liquids at room temperature. Um, so at 25 degrees C, only two elements are liquids. You guys know the two? Everybody usually knows the one. Mercury is, is one of them. So mercury is a liquid at room temperature. Does anybody know the other? It is bromine. Yeah, so bromine's a liquid at room temperature. Um, and then iodine is a solid at room temperature. And so iodine actually is a solid. And so the halogen group is pretty interesting. So the group of halogens like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, because we go from solid to liquid to gas within um, that group of elements, having all three phases present within that group. 
And it also kind of shows you that the, the, the whole group of elements is increasing in their melting point and boiling point as you go from top to bottom, which is kind of an interesting property. Um, so we have the liquid here for mercury and for bromine. Um, and it actually turns out that, um, I believe it's cesium is close. It's like 27 degrees C boiling point, or uh, excuse me, melting point. So if room temperature was like 30 degrees C, we would have three liquid elements. So uh, cesium turns out to be pretty close in boiling point. Um, I actually just saw, I don't know where I saw this yesterday, that francium, there's apparently only 27 grams of francium at one time ever present on Earth within like the Earth's crust. So I mean, francium isn't something you're gonna do any examples with or see like in a bottle. Um, okay, so the, um, um, and so then we have some other groups of elements. We have the alkali group here. So this group here is characterized. Um, I'll actually exclude uh, hydrogen from this group for calling these the alkali metals. Because hydrogen's not a metal, hydrogen's a non-metallic element. Um, sure, some properties with the alkali metals and that they're forming plus one charge ions. So the alkali group is losing one electron in common ions, so lithium plus, sodium plus, K plus. So you've probably seen like potassium plus and like KCl is an example. So something like KCl contains K plus and Cl minus, where the halogen group is predominantly forming anions with a minus one charge. And that minus one charge, if you notice, for the halogens is kind of them picking up an electron and matching that noble gas count of electrons nearby. So if you look at fluorine and think about, OK, how many protons and electrons does a fluorine uncharged atom have? So for a fluorine atom, element number is nine. So we'd have nine electrons. And if we pick up one more, we'd have 10 electrons. So you have 10 electrons if it has an overall minus charge. So F minus 10 electrons, nine protons. If you look at neon, element number 10, 10 protons, 10 electrons. So that noble gas configuration of electrons is, is an especially stable count. So matching that noble gas count for some elements is their driving force for the common charge that you see. So that's why your things like sodium, 11 protons, lose one electron from 11 down to 10, then you match neon's count, that noble gas count. The alkaline group of metals so this group here is the alkaline metals. The alkali is the first group. The alkaline is the second group. Alkaline metals form plus two charged ions. It's the only stable ion that they form. So if you have magnesium, it's never going to be magnesium plus like sodium is. It's going to be magnesium two plus if you encounter it in its ionic form. And that's, of course, magnesium, 12 protons, lost two electrons down to that count of 10, like neon. The transition metals we're going to see are variable in terms of their charges. So the transition metal group of elements is the next group um, across, 10 elements across. We'll see in chapter 6 why it's 10 there, and then why our lanthanide and actinide series are 14 across. So we'll try to see later why it's 10 and 14. You maybe have seen electron configurations before. Uh, but it'll have something to do with the orbitals that those elements are using. And then we have our rest of our main group elements across here from the boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine groups to the noble gases. And so those elements there are just being characterized like aluminum being three away from that noble gas count. So you'll see aluminum forming Al3 plus um, as its common ion. We have a summary chart of some ions in a minute here that you'll see some of these charges summarized. But you can pick up that the group of aluminum. Now, boron doesn't really tend to form ionic compounds the way aluminum does, and really neither do the elements below it. So really just aluminum in its group is the only one that really makes so kind of like classic compounds like AlCl3 um, in an ionic sense. Um, and then on the other side of the, the, the nonmetals, really just the oxygen group and maybe the nitrogen group start making ions. And you can imagine the oxygen group would be a minus two set of charges, because they're two away from the noble gas, and minus three for the nitrogen group. So we'll have a summary on the next slide. I think there's a summary slide of some of these group names. But the, the key group names are the alkali are the first group, alkalins the next group, and then the, the other name that's important, I think, are the halogens, 
the next to last group of elements, and then the uh, noble gases, and of course our transition metals in the middle. I know there's a lot of, or on a slide. Okay, so let's put together the sum of the protons, neutrons, and electrons for chlorine 35 with a minus charge. So let me give you guys a minute or two for this one. So you're just trying to sum up the total number of subatomic particles for this ion. All right, so have we come to any consensus here? Or, the, the main idea, I think, is really just needing to go to that periodic table for the proton count, so making sure we look for chlorine element number 17. So we got 17 protons. So 17 subtracted from 35 is uh, 18 neutrons. And then the electron count, if I have a net negative charge, I've just added one extra electron. So I just added one electron to my proton count to have 18 electrons. Now, we could put equations to it. I don't think we need to think about equations here. If we have a minus two charge, we've added two more electrons to the proton count. So we can just kind of think proton versus electron charge. This balance here is where we get that extra one electron, the minus one charge. And so if we add these up, we arrive at 53. For the most part, coming up with proton and electron counts are really just a matter of knowing how to use the periodic table. We can do this example together because I think it's pretty similar to the previous one. But in the case of lead, it's just maybe a matter of finding lead on the periodic table. Um, but lead is in the carbon group, so it's underneath carbon element number 82. And so that's where we're going to come up with 82 protons. And then with the 2 plus charge, we've just lost two electrons. So the easy thing to always get backwards is seeing the plus and thinking we're adding electrons, but it's not this here, because that would add to the negative charge. We'd have it lead 2 minus if it were that one. OK, so one important experiment that allows us to determine the um, isotopic abundance of elemental samples is um, an experiment known as like mass spectrometry. Uh, a mass spectrometer is a really fascinating experiment because it allows you to determine the molar mass of a sample. So if you have some unknown compound, you can usually find a way to do a mass uh, spec analysis to figure out the molar mass of the sample. So it's a really um, generally easy to do experiment to determine the molar mass of compounds. You can also put something like chlorine in here so you can try to figure out, well, what's the abundance of chlorine? And the way the technique works is it just puts a charge on the atom so then you can use a magnetic field to bend the um, compound or the sample by the mass to charge ratio. And so depending on how much mass the, the sample has, a lighter particle is going to bend sooner, a heavier particle later. So you get the bending um, two different pathways for how the sample bends, and then a detector that can detect on that mass to charge ratio. And so then what we find for chlorine is that we actually get two isotopes. So chlorine contains two isotopes. Not that you have to memorize that, 
but chlorine has two isotopes that are naturally occurring. Sometimes we specify naturally occurring to sort of specify that a natural sample, you could probably create by bombarding of neutrons of the sample an unnatural sample. Uh, but a natural sample contains about a three to one ratio of chlorine 35 to chlorine 37. And so these are showing you the two isotopes. So two different um, elements of the same element, or excuse me, two different atoms of the same element. And so one of them has, like the previous example, has 18 neutrons, and the other one has 20 neutrons. Mass number of 17, so 20 neutrons versus 18 neutrons. So we can exchange that neutral particle and obtain the same general properties. So these two atoms basically, for the most part, have the same set of properties. The few circumstances where they may differ slightly in some of their properties, but for the most part behave very similarly because they're just exchanging a neutral particle and they contain the same plus to minus charge ratio. And so it's really the proton uh, um, count versus the electron count that gives the different elements their properties. So we're not really changing the fundamental properties of the atom by changing the isotopic nature. So it just happens that we get about a three to one ratio. Come back here. It's slightly annoying when I, on the video, for anybody watching the video, because the video will be made by the previous slides video, and then this part of the video will be as if I said this directly. But um, the mass of chlorine 35 is about 35 AMU, and the chlorine is approximately 37 AMU. We could look this up more precisely, but it's like 34.9 something for the chlorine 35. It's like 36.9 something for the 37 isotope. And if I had said to you, well, what do you think the average atomic weight of chlorine is? So on average, you'd say, well, it's probably closer to 35 because we're more abundant in that chlorine 35 isotopic mass. If you notice, the average atomic weight is about 35.5 approximately. So the average atomic weight of chlorine is about 35.5. Doesn't that kind of seem to make sense? That 35, 37, on average, about 35.5. And so that helps us come up with a picture for the average atomic weight of something like chlorine or other elements. If you actually look at chlorine, its atomic weight is 35.45. And one thing that's kind of interesting, let me, so our um, atomic weight scale is that we can take the average atomic weight for an element to be the sum, fancy sum here, over all the natural occurring isotopes using the fraction of a given isotope times the atomic weight of that isotope, where we just sum those up for all natural occurring isotopes. So this will give us our average atomic weight. And so what this means for chlorine would be we take about 75% times 35, about 25% times 37, and that'll arrive at about 35.5 for chlorine. Now for carbon, um, we can obtain carbon's atomic weight by doing this problem here. So let's start lecture next time with calculating the average atomic weight for carbon, talking a little bit more about that problem and moving on from here. All right, guys, enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the football game for those who's going to the game. Have fun at the game if you're going. Uh, should be a lot of fun. And I'll see you on Wednesday, no class Monday.